Hello, and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. In this video, I thought it would be fun to step through what it takes to build a minimum viable product, where you take an AI example or technique that you've created, and you turn it into something that you can actually charge users for and put up on the internet and serve at scale. So this project is going to be broken down into a few components, the first being the actual front end, the way we present the user with the product and let them pay for the service. And so I've chosen to implement this as a Flask app, and I'm hosting it on Replit to make things easy. And so the way this works is by default, when the person visits our site, they're going to see the index.html, and that is just a simple HTML form. So at the moment, this just collects the email and lets them upload a file. Obviously, later we can add styling and examples and so on. Um, once that form is submitted, that's going to call a second route within our Flask app. It's just going to process, check that the file exists, and if it does, save it and store that in a database. And here I'm just using Replit's built-in database, nice and easy. Provided that the file exists and everything works, we're going to redirect them to the checkout flow. And for this, I'm just using the default Stripe um, checkout option. There's tons of good documentation on that on both the Stripe website and there's some great Replit examples as well. Um, so the way this works, we specify in what file we're looking at so that we can then tie this back to the email and the path. Um, and we're creating a new Stripe checkout session where we're passing in a, a definition of the product. In this case, we're just going to be generically calling it your image, but this would be tailored to whatever processing we're doing. And then depending on whether that is successful or not, we'll redirect them to two different um, pages, success or failure, um, both of which at the moment just render a string of text. So you'll notice nowhere here are, are there any processing of the, um, the data itself. That's because in general, when you're accepting payments, you don't want to do anything once the um, the person finishes entering the card details and that's successful, instead you want to wait for the payment to actually go through. So the way that's done with Stripe is that it'll send something called a webhook, which you can configure in the Stripe dashboard. You set it up to call a different route on your server once the payment is, the transaction is completely finished. And so that's what I have here, Stripe webhook. Um, this is going to wait for a message from Stripe and we can check that it's from Stripe using their signature and so on. Um, I have a secret here that I copied from my dashboard. Um, provided it is from Stripe, we can make sure that this is a session.completed uh, webhook. And if we do that, that's when we start our processing. So we don't do any processing once the user originally submits the file. We wait for the payment to actually go through. Um, and then we're going to send the results to the user's email once that's done. Now, at the moment, this process image function that I have here just prints out the image file name and the email. So that's not ideal. Um, so the next part of this project is going to be the AI inference. Um, but what's nice about keeping them separate is that here we can have our server always on. It's not using much resources. It doesn't need a GPU or anything. And this is waiting for users and accepting payment, processing the images, I'm oh, sorry, processing the, um, the payments and the submissions. And then once that's done, we'll hand off that image to be processed on a separate machine with a separate setup. So that's what we'll cover next. All right, for the actual inference part, what we're going to do is lean on something called Replicate, which lets you host uh, models on the cloud pay per second for when they're running, so you're not paying to keep something ongoing all the time. And they've really tried hard to make it easy to recreate an environment so that you can have a consistent way to deploy things. And so if you're used to working locally, this feels like a lot of extra admin, um, but it is really nice because once you go through those steps, then you have something that you know will work once you push it to the cloud. So I've effectively just followed this guide, push a model to replicate. Um, the core idea is that we're going to set up our model um, so in this case, I just have a um, diffusion pipeline that I've saved. So I actually ran this code to load up a, a checkpoint from the Hugging Face Hub and save it to a local folder. And then I ran the steps as shown to initialize cog in that folder or in the sort of parent folder. That's going to be where everything stays. And the idea here is that we're specifying an environment with Docker on the back end. A little scary if you are not used to cloud stuff. Um, but we're going to just rely on following the examples that work. That tends to be a good strategy. If you can find someone else who's done it, that's a good path to follow. And so, for example, I found the SDXL one, and I went and had a look at what their YAML file that defines the environment looked like in terms of requirements and versions and so on. And I basically just copied that. So in my folder here, I created or modified cog.yaml to add the same requirements there, because I figure that's a working and known good system. Um, and then I also modified the predict.py file, which is created by that cog in it, um, to then load up the pipeline that we've saved in this folder, and then to set up the predict function, which is going to take, in this case, just a prompt 
and return an image. So this is as simple as it gets. We can later modify this to take in the image or multiple extra inputs and settings and so on. Um, I'm just aiming for a can I get this working mode. Um, and so then, yeah, continuing to follow the push a model guide, we've specified our dependencies, which has copied them in that case. We've just, um, followed them to see how to set up predictions. Um, then the next step is to test it and make sure it works. One thing that's worth noting is that this is relying on Docker, which means that the first time you run it, it's going to take ages because it has to set up basically a virtual machine with Ubuntu or whatever, um, and it has to install all the dependencies, PyTorch and so on. Um, so the first time you run it, this is going to take like many minutes. Um, but once that's run, hopefully the next time it, it should work. Um, in my case, there are one or two extra steps which I'll talk about um, to get this working. But if all goes well, once you run this, we know that it's working locally in that Docker environment, in that constrained, uh, self-contained setup that we've made. Um, and yeah, that seems to have worked. And if we look at output.png, we get a llama. Um, yeah, so this seems to be working, and this means that the next step is push it to the cloud, and it should work on the cloud too. Um, one thing that's worth noting, there's always extra steps that are missed in any guide, no matter how comprehensive. And in my case, that was like, I thought I'd followed all the steps, but there were some extra things that I needed to do to get Docker working on the system. So as you're going, I find it's really helpful to keep a little diary. Either here, I usually use Notion, uh, but here just in a text file, it's going to stay with this project. Um, what I did in order. So I, I downloaded and installed COG, ran COG in it. Um, I have my model download weights to get the model weights locally, I installed Docker by following the Docker instructions, but then I forgot at first to do some extra things like installing the NVIDIA container toolkit. So I added that. Um, I had some permissions things that I found, um, but running uh, COG predict or pseudo COG predict if you haven't set up the user groups. Um, that only worked once I'd done all these other steps. And if you've missed out some of these, I was getting errors like the Docker couldn't find my GPU and then the code was expecting a GPU, so it was, it was failing. Um, yes, yeah, so it's always a little bit of extra and it's doable to f figure that out, but there's no point in running through those steps multiple times. So once you've got a known working thing, if I come back to this project in a month or two, I can just check this out. Oh yeah, okay, these are the steps I need to do. Say I'm on a new um, computer or something like that. Um, yeah, just figure out what's needed and store that in a text file somewhere. You'll thank yourself later. Okay, so let's push this to the um, to Replicate Hub, and we'll see if we can run that um, via the API. Okay, after a very long time of uploading, the model is now on the Replicate site. Uh, you can try the demo right here, um, and you'll notice if I click Run, it doesn't take too long to produce an output, but the first time you run it, it's going to take several minutes to boot up the machine. And again, if it hasn't had any activity for some time, they're going to shut it down just to save resources. So that is something to be aware of with um, a hosting solution like this. If you're hosting your own model and it's got this um, like cold versus warm issue where it's, it's fast if it's loaded, but it takes a while to load, then you can't expect something real time. So we couldn't, for example, bank on this producing a result in a few seconds for the user uh, kind of reactively, um, which is not a problem for our demo use case. We're planning to send them via email after some amount of time. It is something to be aware of. If you want, I believe that they have options to keep it always on. Same with Hugging Face inference endpoints. You can um, pay a little bit extra to keep the machine running the whole time. Um, but that kind of defeats the purpose of being able to pay per second. Like if I look at the run times and costs here, um, this takes a few seconds to run and it's less than a cent per second. So um, very, very low cost to produce an image. Um, yeah, so that's something to bear in mind. If you use a popular existing model, chances are it's going to be always on and available. And if it's your own custom thing, then the first time um, someone makes a request after a while, it's going to take a little bit longer to boot up. Um, but the nice thing with having it here is that we can switch over to the API. Um, we can get, well, in this case, we want uh, Python. Um, and we end up with code that looks something like this, where we authenticate with our API token, which you can get from the account. And then we can send our requests to it programmatically and get the response. And the response in this case is just another owl with a hat. I should probably change that. Um, but yeah, that's going to be the final piece that we then call um, something like this API from our Flask app that's handled the payments and so on. Um, so I'm going to redo this with the, the application that I actually want um, that's going to take in an image and do a lot more processing, generate multiple images and so on. Um, but I'll do that. I'll do some styling. And then I'll record the final segment of this video showing how it all comes together. Um, and hopefully uh, giving some tips on how you could replicate this for yourself. So penultimate update here. 
um, I'm back in the Flask app and now in the webhook we call this process image function where before we were just doing a dummy function now we're going to run a separate script and feeding in the file name and the email um, and so that's going to be where we do the call to replicate um, so this is the, the script here yeah given a file path and an email um, we're going to create a um, call to the replicate API um, the token is stored as a secret on replit um, I'm going to pass in a prompt and an image this is what the user uploads and hopefully um, get that back as a URL um, and so then that's going to be passed to the send email function which I basically just copied from this blog post here um, you would probably want to use something like Twilio I think is another popular option um, but yeah for some reason that wasn't working for me so I switched to Brevo um, yeah setting up some configuration following the docs of the provider that seems to be like an ongoing theme of this project that I found you just find an example that works and slightly modify that um, and in fact ask GPT-4 to modify that has been my general approach um, yeah so we're taking the image we are grabbing the data from that and encoding it and putting it as an attachment to the email um, so without further ado let's see what this looks like in looks like an action so I'll put in my actual email um, I'll choose a file a yeah, generated photo it's great and I'll hit upload and this should take me to the stripe checkout where I can again my email use the stripe um, test page the these numbers don't really matter other than the card number so I'll just rush through those and then hopefully we should see the success page the payment was successful and now on the back end um, I'm waiting for Stripe to send a webhook so I should see another webhook pitch up um, here yeah okay there we go We've got a webhook there that's sent the completed one which will have called this which in turn will have called my process image function um, and will hopefully have sent the email so let's go to my inbox hey hey <laughs> there we go there's me as a wizard um, that's the first time it's worked so <laughs> I'm pretty pleased with that um, yeah I'm not going to record a final view of the slick if I do turn this into something I'm hoping I'll put some styling and, and get it out um, but yeah if you're willing to replicate this yourself the main thing that I found is that all of these pieces are pretty well documented and doable it's just a lot of plowing through um, you know example usage and stack overflow um, I got GPT-4, ChatGPT to just write most of my um, code here saying look here's this error I'm getting what could that be um, I'm using this I found this example can you modify my send email function um, not that I couldn't write this code myself obviously but it's just much nicer to have something that's you know a bit more meticulous and slow and also has seen a gazillion stripe checkout examples before um, so that's a really nice tip is just to lean heavily on um, something like this for this kind of boilerplate um, and then again yeah finding examples someone has managed to do it that's a good starting point um, then you can go and copy that you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, and combining that with the documentation for whatever service that you're using be that stripe be that uh, replicate be that whatever email provider you end up trying um, so I hope that's been an inspiring and interesting little journey this was me basically stretching these muscles I haven't done a flask app for a very long time <laughs> and I haven't ever used stripe because until recently I have lived in a country that isn't supported by any of the payment things so it's fun like getting to actually like try out what does it look like to make an app um, that actually charges users that actually delivers um, some processed image via email um, I think it's it's quite fun to see what it takes it's not that hard this took a morning um, to take a machine learning demo and turn it into something that's um, productized for want of a better word so I enjoyed that I hope you did too we'll see you in the next video